Well, folks, I think we're, uh, we're ready to begin. Um, we've got this week and next week, but uh, I'll start us with prayer and, and kind of do a recap. Uh, Holy One, uh, enable us to think in fresh ways, to be together in fresh ways, have vibrant conversation, and be ones who sense the movement of your spirit, even if it's in ways of being that we have never thought of before. In Jesus we pray. So, um, in the uh, administration of President Thomas Jefferson, uh, they made the Louisiana Purchase, over doubling the size of the United States, at least in territorial properties. And they really didn't even know what they had purchased. So, we all know the story of the Lewis and Clark expedition, right? They got uh, a group of explorers together to head out west to see what they could find. And one of the goals was to identify a, a passage across the country to the Pacific Ocean that would be economical. Because they'd already discovered going up the Mississippi, they could eventually connect to the Great Lakes system. The Erie Canal was already in the planning stages. The idea being water transport would open up the continent. And so they had people who were Great Lakes trappers on the expedition. They had uh, some people from the Navy on the expedition, uh, people who knew the Missouri and the Mississippi River, and they headed up the river, and then up the Missouri, and they thought, at least um, Lewis and Clark thought, that um, they would eventually find their way up some creek far enough that they could then portage their canoes over some low hills or through some forest, and then get in a creek that would eventually become a stream that would eventually become a river that would pour into the Pacific Ocean. That was the plan. That was seemed reasonable based on previous experience in this continent. And that's how they were going to do it. Something got in the way. <laughs> the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> and in his, in his journal, it was actually when they finally realized what they were looking at were actual mountains just was beside himself and not sure what they were going to do. And so the concept of canoeing the mountains actually comes from that. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with the book. Has anyone heard? I see one person not yet. Yeah. Written in uh, 20, 2015 by uh, Todd Bolsinger. He's now um, uh, Dean of Students at Fuller Seminary. At the time he was uh, the lead pastor of a Presbyterian church. He's Presbyterian out in California, a large Presbyterian church. And uh, he tells this story quite, quite well, far better than I did. And he points out that all of a sudden these uh, people who understood how to canoe rivers or how to raft on large rivers were faced with a dilemma. They could either turn around and go back and with failure, or they could learn new skills. And they set the canoes aside, they bargained with some of the native people, got some horses, learned about some, some new skills in hunting, and they made it over the Rocky Mountains and eventually down to the Pacific Ocean. And Bolsinger uses this argument to point out that the church is in a place where it needs to learn new skills, basically. And that's what we want to talk about today. I mean, in the first three classes, we looked at we're in a moment of disruptive change, the likes of which we have not seen in memory or, or for hundreds of years, maybe ever. Uh, technological impacts on the church we talked about. We talked about the, the stunning demographic shifts happening, happening in our society, the fundamental cultural shifts that are going on with all of this. And really, um, the essence of it is that the world, our children, and grandchildren are going to inhabit is radically different than the world we know. And once you start thinking in those terms, you really see it everywhere. I mean, I, uh, I have a subscription, online subscription to the New York Times, and I'm an avid reader. Can't tell you how many of the, the stories and articles I read in the New York Times, I see through that, that prism of the change dynamic in our culture. Look at, I mean, the tragedy of the Israeli Hamas war going on right now. 
Once upon a time, in our society, in European society, the backing of Israel when it was under attack was absolute. And suddenly it's not. There's a fundamental demographic shift happening in Europe and the United States and elsewhere. I saw a piece uh, written by a columnist by the name of Ross Dohart just a couple of days ago. You can, you can look it up if you're a New York Times reader. And he was pointing about <coughs> the demographic shift, shift that's going to happen in the later half of the 21st century. And one little fact just really drove it home, just a little fact of it. He pointed out that in the second half of the 21st century, Great Britain, now when I think of Great Britain, I think of Queen Elizabeth, I think of Shakespeare, I think of you know, Churchill, I, uh, Buckingham Palace, all those things that we think of as British. In the second half of the 21st century, that's just a generation, a little more than a generation away, one third of their population will need to be first century, first generation immigrants just to sustain their current level of economic activity. And if the birth rate among people continues to decline at its current rate, over half of the population will have to be first generation immigrants just to sustain. Think about the impact of that on the culture of Great Britain, the culture of Shakespeare, the culture. Our children are going to live in a radically different world than you and I. And they're already there. I mean, if you, if you go to our elementary schools, you can already see it. And the United Methodist Church is in the cotton, cotton mill of it. It's a predominantly white, increasingly culturally progressive, and in its worship style and approach toward ministry, highly organized and, and highly um, rational. And in the 21st century society that we're living in, the Christian church is going to be made up of predominantly first and second generation immigrants. It's going to be increasingly culturally traditional. And it's going to be, in its worship style and the way it approaches life, more emotive and, as we talked about two weeks ago, even more charismatic. Do we see the dilemma? Yeah. So, so what do we do to navigate the future? And, and I recognize, you know, I'm not going to be here for most of that future. Um, which is true, I think, for most of us here. But the actions we take now and the things we do now are going to set the stage for how the Christian church not only survives, but thrives in the 21st century, in the balance of the 21st century. So, what are some of the things that we can do? Well, the first one is, we need to take stock of the assets we have. We have tremendous assets to be put to use. It's real tempting to fall into despair and to think, oh, what are we going to do? This is going to be overwhelming. But in point of fact, every church has tremendous assets available to it for the future. What are some of the assets we have here? Just anything. We have the Absolutely. Property, ten acres. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is a pretty prime piece of property. What percentage of the building is used throughout the week? Five percent? Pretty typical church in American society, right? Mm -hmm. You have all of this physical resource that is available for use. Prime location. I was sharing just prior to the start that uh, down at the Holland Church, when I got there, most of their Sunday school classrooms were already closed and empty. Um, they had a daycare center. The daycare center, I think, is in its last year, this year. Um, a for-profit daycare center. And that would basically mean 
they'd be down to one Sunday school classroom they would need. And that is compared to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, thirteen classes. They had thirteen classrooms for children's Sunday school. And they would be down, when I got there, to a nursery and one room classroom. Well, they had space. So we opened our doors and said to a local non for profit that did outreach ministry with people experiencing homelessness, among other things, would you like to rent some, some space and set up offices? And that's what they did. What's another asset you have? And you don't make money off it. You can't, you can't legally make money off it. You can't charge rent higher than, than cost. But it's about making use of your assets to continue the ministry. People in membership. That's two people. The typical uh, mainline Protestant church has a ton of people at a stage in life as well where they have a lot of time for volunteering available. That's a prime asset. Go ask any non-for-profit agency how they're doing with volunteers. And they'll tell you, we're desperate. Please come help. Everybody's desperate for people. Everybody's desperate for people. <coughs> and you've got people. Including a very higher than average percentage of people who are retiree and able to do volunteer work. That's a tremendous asset. Tremendous asset. What's another one? Outreach programs. Okay. Give me a, a, an example of that. Food pantry. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe call that uh, established ministry. How do you determine how long a established ministry functions? And what is your process for determining when an established ministry no longer is serving the needs? That is a big question. I think, that, <laughs> I think there's always the need. I think it's whether we get lazy or not. Because we also have hand to hand. We well, used to do kids' food basket. We used to do a mission downtown, and people just aged out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you age out, or did the need age out? No. People age out. Sometimes both. Sometimes I don't think the need aged out. No. It's still yes. there. Some no. needs just never aged out. The needs that we've done are still there. Mm -hmm. I think we. There's a poster about um, kids' baskets. Yeah. yeah. They're going to, yeah. Yeah. That program has expanded greatly over the last several years. There's been more schools yeah. over the last four or five years. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> What's your process for ongoing evaluation of everything you do to see if it's meeting a need and effective, or if it needs to change, or if it needs to die? Churches are really good at establishing things and not letting them go when their time is up. One of, one of the things, Such as. this gets into um, really what I'm going to talk more about next week, which is your processes. One of the processes that every church needs to work at is evaluating how it's working and what needs to change, or maybe what needs to be let go of. We focus on whether we can meet the cost. Right. Cost can be a factor in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I served a church once that had this, um, once upon a time, uh, just, a, just an amazing uh, once a week lunch for seniors. It was, I mean, they just brought in seniors from all over the community. They gave them a, uh, you know, an at-cost kind of lunch sort of deal. And by the time I got there, it was hardly utilized. And the people who were doing it were just kind of keeping it going 
and the number of people doing it had shrunk, but that was okay. The number of people utilizing it had shrunk even more. And what they could say about that ministry was, well, we've done it for 40 years. Now, that's a great record. But did it need to continue? So what are the processes the church puts in place for ongoing evaluation of its ministries and its activities? Who does that evaluation? <laughs> the first thing you got to No, I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm serious. Church, yeah. That's part of their responsibility, is right. to be ongoing evaluated. You know, one of the design functions of our United Methodist system is to sustain the status quo. If you read the Book of Discipline and the structure of committees in the traditional United Methodist Church, the underlying assumption behind it is this system works and you just need to work the system. So it's here to sustain the status quo. We're moving into a world where the status quo is no longer sustainable. So the denomination is saying things like board governance, which I know you've done. Yeah. That's part of part of the process of, of kind of letting go of what was for what could be. I think volunteers and money come down. Those two things are really important for what a church can do. Giving. There's another one of your greatest assets. Money. We are people with more disposable income. That's income beyond what we need to house ourselves, to clothe ourselves, to feed ourselves. We are, and I'm talking about myself as a baby boomer, we are people with more disposable income than any group of people who have ever lived on this planet. Think about that. We have the potential, based on how we utilize the assets we have, to still have great impact. A couple of weeks ago, I, I wrote this phrase. How I forgot to spell how. <laughs> how do we resource the next generation? And notice the choice of the language. How we resource them. It's not how do we say this is how you do church. It's not I would say, well, come be a part of what we've already established. It, it turns things on its head and asks the questions, how do we resource? Does the church have a, an endowment? Have you thought about plan giving to your endowment? Simple reality is the vast majority of churches are, in the future are not going to be sustained based on people's earnings. You know our model for right? I make X number of dollars a year, right? And so I give a percentage of that income to the local church. That's not a model that's sustainable for the future. So how is the church focusing on building up other sources of income? What could it be? And here's the thing. Because of, you know, we know our life experience, we assume that the church traditionally has been funded by people earning an income and giving a percentage of their income to the church. That, throughout Christian history, is not the way the church has been traditionally funded. That is actually, what we have experienced in our lives, is actually an aberration of how the church has historically been funded. Going all the way back to the book of Acts, historically the church has been funded primarily by the few with the resources to establish and support the ministry because that is their gift. And in, in Scripture, when we read about and hear about the various spiritual gifts, one of those gifts is giving. 
and some folks have been blessed in such a way that they can do that work. And all of us in the wealthiest society that was ever created have time and that we have property and we can even, even if it's not as much as we think it might be, we have the financial resources to make a sustained difference. What do you think? your young people, I mean, that, that's important, too. You know, I mean, if you've got largely older members supporting most of your church financially, that means they're not going to be there 20 years from now, and they've got to be replaced with other people that are going to be financially supporting them. So how do we, who are not going to be here 20 years from now, financially support the church? years from now. We've got to be attracting them well, to be, you know, for it to be where they want to be and, and a part of it. That's one piece of it, right? Attract new people. Now it's not, in this society, it's not young people. The coming Christians are going to be immigrants. Well, right. are they going to be what? Immigrants. First and oh, second generation okay. immigrants. But are they, still it's going to have to be the younger ones. Because the older well, ones are yeah. going to be there too yeah. long, yeah, yeah. for a long term. What, I, what I'm suggesting is all of us have a capacity to one degree or another to put money into the life of the church that is there long after we're gone. So I will, have, will money to the church. Yeah. yeah. I had a contact uh, yeah. from an individual who cares deeply about our Wesley Foundations a week and a half ago. And his, he asked me, how much do I have to give in order to establish a foundation, an endowment for uh, the Wesley Foundation in Kalamazoo? Mm -hmm. And I said, do they have an endowment at this point? He said, no, I, I want to do something. So what's, you know, how much do I have to give? And he thought there was like a magic number, like I had to give 50000 100000 or something like that. I said, how much do you want to give? Right. Give them, you know, five thousand dollars, and they can take a, uh, a five percent draw on that. That's two hundred and fifty dollars a year in perpetuity that they will always have under their budget. There's no magic number. So if one person gives a million dollars, that's great. Doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Thirty-five years of ministry, I saw it once. I went woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> But if 150 people each give an average of 10,000, that's probably even better. Mm -hmm. Is that how some of the large growing churches are, are being funded now? Yeah. yeah. They're being funded that way, and by, by and this is a horrible language, but it's adopted from, from uh, the business community. Point of purchase sales. Huh. Mm -hmm. You know what a point of purchase sale is? Uh -huh. You're at the checkout counter and you see that copy of um, National Enquirer with the great headline. <laughs> nobody ever buys it, right? No. <laughs> Most popular newspaper in the country, but nobody ever buys it. <clears throat> right? And you just got it, you know, oh, it's, it's about the British royal family. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a point of purchase sale. So, when you have a really good study like this, people have an app on their phone, and at the end of the study, the person says, hey, if you found this meaningful and helpful, remember to support the church. And people go on their phone, click the app, boom, 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. That's increasingly becoming the way, mm -hmm. one of the streams through which churches finance themselves. And it's not, so it's, it's the traditional model of stewardship campaigns. It's that point of purchase sell, and it's endowments to sustain churches long term. But you know, I kind of have a question. Like yep. that model kind of makes me mad, to be honest, because every young person I know makes so much more money than I've ever made in my life. So, like, why should I scrimp and save to support? Not that I'm not. I'm not. I'm just saying. From a selfish perspective, sure. I'm going to scrimp and I'm going to save and sure. I'm going to 
go without and then donate it. But like, it, that kind of seems like, why aren't you, like, how am I just funding you, but like, you don't care? So why am I doing that? If it's how not going to kind of continue on. Those high income young people who make more than you, you've ever made in your life. Yeah. What percentage of them are active in church? Probably not. And very few. Small. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you get them active? By us giving more? One of, the, one of the things I'm trying to say in this, and this is the hard part for us to wrap ourselves around, it's a new world. If you think it's about activating young people who look like us, the few that are interested are going up the street, and you can't compete with Chapel. I haven't been in that one, but I've been in a lot like them, man. I've talked about it, you know, slide going down in the Sunday school room, the whole thing. Right? Who are the coming Christians? African diaspora individuals emigrating to this country. I've, I, you know, I'm doing this work with disaffiliating churches for the conference, and it looks like in total between the first round in June and the second round now. It's going to be somewhere around 120 churches. Um, I, I'm chuckling because during worship, my phone exploded with a congregation that met today and realized that they were way behind and that they're not sure if they're going to make it. And they wanted to talk to me right now. And I'm like, I'm listening to my wife's groups. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> that was my way to go. <laughs> Yeah, one of them blew up, and I'm like, you're just going to have to wait. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, these folks are coming in. Of those 120 churches, you probably have a bigger Sunday school than any of those, except three. One was Cornerstone. We all know the Cornerstone story. One is Dexter, which is kind of on the eastern side of the state a fast-growing exurb of the Detroit area. And one is Mount Hope in Lansing. And I bet it has the largest Sunday school of the three of them. Do you know what that Sunday school is made up of? The, the children of first-generation gener immigrants from Africa. I'm not and that, those folks are going to need your financial support. So I'm not disputing that I think you're right on, but we're in Jenison, and it's like white. Where do we find these people? Yeah. They're coming. So I mean, so, yeah. trust me because I work <laughs> yeah. at Grand Rapids Public School, and yeah. we have a whole bunch of kids from first generation African. Their parents are from Africa. I mean, it's a big, huge community down in Grand Rapids, right? This right. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about your assets now, and you're saying, I've now learned. Here's what the coming Christians are going to look like. So now I have to go out and learn, where are they in my community? And how do I engage with them? And is it the programming I'm currently doing that will help me engage with them? Or is it a new programming that I'm going to have? And we have to approach them, or anybody else, with the spirit of wanting them to be with us, or us with them, for more than helping us pay our bills. Right. Yeah. <laughs> everything has to change. Worship style, everything. It's no longer come be a part of us. When we all looked alike and thought alike and acted alike and believed alike, okay, that sort of makes sense. No. Now it's an openness to how are we going to be together. So do you think I was going to say, is this specific location in Jenison going to be a, a hindrance for us or an obstacle to overcome? Or do we have to relocate to where more of the people are located and living? I think that's a conversation to have. Increasingly, the cost of maintaining these is a hindrance to ministry for more and more of our churches. They're no longer an asset, they're a liability because they're putting so much money into them. I served the church in New Buffalo 
and we built a new building three times larger than the one that we had left, and the cost of maintenance and, and utilities almost like in half. And they designed a building that integral to the design would be it was a community space first with a sanctuary on attached to it so that community organizations could feel comfortable using it. And I'm pleased to say they started using it right away and I've heard recently they're getting more and more used that way. So. Or the other resolve is get more retirees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are as they say a limited commodity though, right? <laughs> I know. And, and, and here's, here's, the, here's the truth. Um, I'll, I'm going to let the Kay and Sherry back me on this, tell me if I'm off base. Right now, our churches in mainline Protestantism and United Methodist Church are all making a decision. Some of them are making it intentionally. Most of them are making it by not thinking about it. And the decision they're making whether they're just going to stay as they always have and just be comfortable together until they die as a church or whether they're going to change with no guarantee of success. I talked about disaffiliation. We had a, a church disaffiliated. I won't share a name. Literally, I literally came in to make their final payment and Representatives, one of them said out loud, We just want to be left alone until we die. And I'm not saying that's a bad option. That's an option I think a lot of our churches are making without thinking about it, and some are thinking about it. That's an option. But, you know, the other option is to. Get on Mission Insight, which is a site that will tell you demographics about your community and do those kind of work. There are other outside organizations that will help you start thinking about who's really in your community. Yeah? So what decision is our church is going to do? Are we going to change or are we going to die out? I think that's a decision every church is making right now in mainline Protestant Christianity, whether they know it or not. So what is our church doing? I'm, I'm new here. <laughs> I think we're having a meeting. I, in, all, in all candor, in all candor most churches are not having these conversations, and I think you're beginning to have these conversations. And I want to say another piece to it. What I am describing over these weeks is a river that is flowing right. We all see where that river is going. The large demographic, cultural shifts. We all see where the river is going. But in any river, there are little places, you know, little eddies, little currents that kind of back up a little or go off to the side and, and are stable for a while. I'm not saying you have something here that is not sustainable. It might be sustainable for quite some time to come. I'm saying you need to do the research to see if it is, because in mass, everything's going one way. Does that make sense? Well, if you take the easy out, <clears throat> excuse me, you take the easy out and bury your head in the sand, I mean, I'm of an older yeah. age to look at this. I don't want the church to just stay where it is and just pretend that nothing's happened because the church needs young people, young people that are, you know, bringing in their families. The church will never grow unless we continue as we are fortunately right now, we have gotten some young families. Yeah. I, it's just wonderful when I see <laughs> all these new people because I think, wow, finally. Yeah. You know, but you can't just bury your head in the sand and think it's all going to go away because yeah. it's not, you know. Yeah, and I'm not saying you're, you're, I mean, I'm not saying you become unsustainable tomorrow or 10 years from now. I don't know. I don't know the specifics here. I'm just telling you the large, overarching trends that, that Yeah, if well, I could just see that for myself, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm the, good the that we're having is, these classes, yeah. but 
I look around and I look around at, you know, people that even in my own family or whatever, yeah. where that tradition is going. And, and, you know. One yeah. thing yeah. as a positive here is being all on one level. Oh, I, mean, yes. I mean, as far as this building, what, how it can yeah. be used, where compared with a lot of churches, that's not the case. So uh, no that's steps. one thing that's a positive. You have a ton of potential. Yeah. It's how you choose to use, choose it. use it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the Detroit Conference of the United Methodist Church, I actually was very good friends with the... Um, uh, I can't remember his exact title, but he was in charge of African American studies in the church. Uh -huh. And he went from church to church and, um, you know, educated the uh, pastors and, you know, got um, classes going and whatnot. And, you know, maybe we need something like that in the, um, I, I don't know how the conferences are split anymore. I think they've changed it since I was over there. But, um, you know, I think maybe we need to have uh, more cultural diversity uh, in our classes. And I think a good conversation with the Grand Rapids Area United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How do we reach out in our larger area to the population that's right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm kind of still on the money. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you a bit. Yeah, we're, um, so let's say we're helping to resource the church as it's coming to be, right? Uh -huh. First generation African yeah. immigrants. Sure. Do you yeah. see that then could that possibly be sustaining for them in the future? Like, will they kind of be able to pick up the responsibility, so to speak, and then will it be sustainable at that point? Do you know what I mean? Because, like, it just seems like that if it isn't, it's not going to succeed anyway. So how do we keep, like, you know, when we're all gone or whatever, how does that help? I so guess, probably the best answer to that question is to look at the story of past immigration to the United States. When my German ancestors came here, Did it die off, or did they build something and build to their future? When Eastern European and Italians emigrated in the late 1800s, early 1900s, did it peter out, or did they build something as they established themselves for the future? Um, I'm actually kind of a, a real patriot and an optimist about the society in which I live. There's a, there is, in my mind, a magic about this land that people come here and whatever wherever they come from whatever limitations were on them there they get off the boat and they say I'll work I'll do it mm -hmm. and um, they just build it for their children mm -hmm. that's my that's that's the American story mm -hmm. and that's a tremendous asset we have um, I I'm not worried about the next generation of immigrants they're they're going to bring vibrancy and energy and hustle and all the rest to our culture. That's if our politicians let them in. <laughs> well, well, let's not get political. <laughs> oh, I want you, but let's not. <laughs> so, so we have assets. Let's begin to look at leadership. Uh, things have moved quickly, and then we'll, uh, we'll continue with leadership next week, and we'll also look at processes. So, if you read this book, Canoeing the Mountains, by Todd Holzinger, you'll read that he's saying there are certain leadership skills that are needed for the 21st century. And that um, he's talking to church leaders. And they basically fall under that, that rubric called adaptive leadership skills. Has anyone heard the term adaptive? A few people are not in there yet. It's kind of was a hot buzzword when he wrote this, and it still is. Let me just say about, I'm going to read a quote from the book. Adaptive challenges, that is, these kind of things we've been talking about for the last four weeks, cannot be solved with one's existing knowledge and skills, 
requiring people, they require people to make a shift in their values, expectations, attitudes, habits, and behavior. Wow. That's not easy. So what are some of the skills we need to develop? I got my list, but I kind of like it here. <laughs> Just, I, I think they kind of are common sense. What do you think some of the skills you might need to develop for this brave new world right here? Imagination. Mm -hmm. that's <laughs> right there. That's, yeah. The church has always been good at saying, we've never done it that way before. Mm -hmm. The church can no longer do that. Mm -hmm. What constitutes ministry? What constitutes worship? I mean, at some point, somewhere, someone did the first video screen in worship. And people went, what are you doing? And you know what? That person's imagination transforming worship still. Adaptability. Yeah. I'm going to write it differently. Yeah. Willing to change. Oh, I spelled that wrong. I spelled it wrong. I got it right. Hooray. Hooray. Yeah. A willingness to change. A willingness to try something and say, Wow, that failed spectacularly. We're going to stop doing that. I was in an appointment one time, and the church hit when I arrived there had flattened out. And so I took a program from a previous appointment and said, we're going to do this. And we're just going to do this this year. And it was the program was a smashing success. And everyone said, oh, I can't wait till we do it again next year. And I said, no, 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 no. That's not the point. The point isn't to say, oh, we're going to do the same thing every year, every year, forever and ever. It's to be flexible to say, what are the things that we have to try? And what are the things we have to let go of periodically? Yeah. Here's another one we often don't think of. There's a word we don't often see in the church. Fight through What do we do to people who try to create change? Crucify <laughs> them. Yeah. <laughs> we know that intimately as Christians. You've got to be willing to just stay the course when the resistance comes. And it, it will come. I think listening is important. I think some of that resistance could be a positive if you take it in the right way. Sure, you might you might learn something. Yeah. I mean, just because you've always done it that way isn't right. a reason to still do it. Right. But I'll tell you from firsthand experience, as Jerry will tell you, mm -hmm. my MO throughout my life in the church has been to be a change agent. Yeah. Lots of resistance. The resistance will be sometimes really mm -hmm. dirty. <laughs> <laughs> people want it to be. I, I helped build a new church, and, and uh, there were allegations. It even got printed in the local newspaper that I was taking kickbacks for selling the old, selling the old property. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah. So it, you got to be able to just be prepared. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, listen. To say, hey, we're going to be, we're going to put a team together, and we're going to learn about what's going on. We're going to, we're going to figure this out. Um, tell you, tell you a story. When I was in New Buffalo, where we built a new church, Sherry and I had been there for a number of years, and we got the call to move to a new appointment. And I was about 45. We were about 45 years old, 
and um, uh, the appointment didn't work out. We ended up staying there. And I was like, wow, if I'm going to be here a while, I'm going to start learning. What's going on in the Christian church? What's, what, what are the trend lines and everything? And so I started reading eclectically and wide and learning all of these things. And one Sunday in November, it was probably about five months after we learned we were not going to be moving. They came in. We, we, we had hymnals. We didn't have any screens. We were a very traditional church at that point. And there was a whiteboard up front like this. And in the midst of the whiteboard was this. Well, turn that again. The back half of the Pell curve. Right? And I gave what... What I was told was the strangest sermon by one guy he'd ever heard. Then he said, but it was the best sermon I've heard. And I, I got up there and I said, okay, I want to talk to you about General Motors today. And they all just looked at me. I drew out standard deviation, right? Same gap from here to here as here to here. And I said, said to the folks, I said, do you know in 1960 General Motors had sold 50% of the cars in the United States as American. I said, now you go out 20, 20 years later, and okay, they're still doing pretty good. They, they're selling about 40% of the cars in the United States. Then you go out 20 years from that, and, and they all just looked at me. And I said, but you didn't come here, and I wrote the numbers down. I don't remember the numbers. I, I erased the numbers. I said, but you didn't really come here to run about general. I said, you're probably more interested in something like that. I said, I don't know. The decline of Christianity in Europe. And then I wrote, same shape, same deviation. I wrote the numbers for the decline of Christianity in Europe over the mid-20th century. And I said, you're probably not interested in that. And I wiped that away. I said, you're probably interested in something like the United Methodist Church in the United States. The numbers here, here, and said, why don't we write about here? And I went like, I just pointed like that. And I said, but you know, how real is that? I said, well, let's talk about the, the well-being of the Christian church in your community. And I showed them how at one point they had X number of churches and two Christian schools. And that they were now, at this point, and then I told them the exact year they would have three churches left and no schools. It happened two years prior to when I predicted. Mm -hmm. And we got to that, that point. We got to that point. They're all listening now. And, and I said to them, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to make, uh, I said, I'm, I'm uh, going to make a confession and a promise. And I said, my confession is, I guess I've intuitively known this is what's been happening in our culture my whole career. But I've always thought to myself, eh, I've got this nice church. It's comfortable. These are my people. We have a lot of fun with them. Right, Sherry? And I said, I've got mine to hell with the rest of the world. And of course, whenever a pastor says something like to hell with the rest of the world, <laughs> up front, everybody listens. And they all listen, I said. And here's the confession. What I thought was just a passing phrase is literally true. And I said, my promise to you is, whatever we do in the remaining of my years here, I'm not going to let any of us forget this, including myself. And we're going to learn Now, you may learn, and you may not have to do much different, or you may learn some big things, I don't know. But it all starts with learning. You look at our area, and there's a high percentage of Christian schools yeah. compared with a lot of places. Yeah. So, I mean, that's probably an issue to think about. I mean, especially the churches that are real connected with those yeah. schools. Well, and that comes in, now you've got, you've got reform culture in yeah. play in that. And that's a unique dynamic here that you really have to think through that I confess I don't know enough about. I, I mean, I was six years in Holland, and I felt like I knew less than I went afterwards than when I went in. So, 
such an interesting mm -hmm. cultural phenomenon. And that is something we have to think about. All of this, all of this means, above all else, if the church is not relational and doesn't say, we're going to lean into relationship first and, and not lean into this is how we do it, not lean to be, you've got to be a part of us this way, or you've got to believe these things. If you're not relational first, the rest isn't going to matter. And that, um, whether you read Volsinger or Heisinger or any of the adaptive leader, leadership groups, it's always the same thing. If you want to navigate adaptive change as a leader, you've got to spend more time on relationship. That's one of the things in his book that changed the way I, I worked as a leader is he basically said, if you're not spending over half your time in one-on-one in -on -one sessions with your staff, you're not leading. And then it became almost a, well, it actually became a joke with the staff, but if you want to find Brad, don't go to his office. Because he's not there. Go knock on everybody else's door. Because it was about maintaining the relationship. All right. Final thoughts, comments? Yeah. It's kind of, I think, all those the points what I've been thinking is if the church of the future will be made up of immigrants and they're going to feel comfortable among us, then I think we white people have to give up our tendency toward patronization. Yes. Yes, we do. That's hard, too. Because we don't even know when we're doing it. I, I might have mentioned this short. Sherry and I were in Chicago two and a half, three weeks ago now. And um, there was a, uh, a leader, a white gentleman about my age. And this was all church leaders from across the Midwest in this meeting. And he was calling on different people. And then uh, a woman who was an African-American leader uh, stood up and called him out and said, I find it interesting to note that when this person talked, this person, you know, he was introducing videos. When the African... Uh, leader spoke, he said, he goes a little long, but, you know, it'll be okay, right? You had to, you know, as if, why, why couldn't he go long, right? And she just called him out on it. And he kind of acknowledged it, and then the, it continued on, right, the conversation and him calling on different leaders. And he said, well, we'll speak to this person next. And then he saw a, a, a white gentleman his age, who he knew personally, and he said, and then we'll speak to this guy, and I know he'll be good. And I thought to myself, oh, wow. you did it again. You don't even know you're doing it. Mm -hmm. I think we live with that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all do that without thinking yeah. about it. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's hard to overcome mm -hmm. what, and I think some of the, some of the current language, like white privilege, mm -hmm. and I'm more on to say white male privilege, which is actually very helpful. And so that just kind of leaned, we, you know, there, there's this reaction, right? Especially if you felt like your whole life, I'm not biased or I'm not prejudiced or when someone calls you, you, you just want to, no, no, no. Take a deep breath. Be in a relationship. Listen open. And I stink at it. <laughs> But I don't think there's any other way for it for the church. That's spot on. Brad, if, is Chapel Point doing everything right for the future, or will they run into difficulties too with, with the change in the culture? I can't speak specifically to Chapel Point. I would say that some of the best of those kind of churches, they're grounded in, they've taken, as I talked a few weeks ago, 
They've taken lessons from the business community about marketing and customer relationship and development. And some of the smartest of them have become very slick at adapting. Guy to watch is uh, Rick Warren out at Saddleback. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that long ago mm -hmm. when Rick Warren was the leader in the movement to keep California from approving weddings, marriage mm -hmm. for gay and lesbian people. Mm -hmm. Saddleback's in a different position now. Mm -hmm. They're quite odd. They don't talk about that at all. Right? I can tell you, in my experience, when, the, when we became a uh, reconciling church in Holland, the number one group of people we got after that were people who said, I've been going to, and they would name one of these mega churches, forever and ever, and I just thought I was accepted. And it was when I said, I'll volunteer to be a Sunday school teacher. And they said, oh, well, no, we're glad you're here. We're happy you're here. But no, you can't teach Sunday school. Right. Mm -hmm. And their jaws hit the floor. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the answer is, right? How, how are they going to adapt? Mm -hmm. Churches cycle. They do with what you're saying. Yeah. They do. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's I don't know other churches not about in this China area point that are very big that right. aren't anymore. Yeah. The great cathedrals of Europe, mm -hmm. go to one on a Sunday morning. Just because of your bid doesn't necessarily mean. Right. So I think Chapel Point started today a whole new worship schedule. Maybe so. I go by I did. I go by yeah. 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 And yeah. my point is that they are willing to experiment. Yeah. And they do change, and they do try to find out what works for people, mm -hmm. um, whether it's Sunday morning or Christmas Eve. We recently just sort of had discussions about that. And, mm -hmm. and many of us get ingrained in, we like this time, mm -hmm. or this is how we've always done it. Yeah. Right. Not what is working for our society today. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. I, I'll tell you a story. When I was in, in New Buffalo, our Christmas Eve service had kind of maxed out in size, and so we said, well, we're going to do a Christmas Eve service on Christmas Eve, and we're going to do another one on the 23rd. And so we did that, and it worked. The 23rd eventually, the, the ones before Christmas Eve became bigger than Christmas Eve, because people were like, oh, we can be our family and everything. And the superintendent at the time heard about this, and he was like, I'm going to tell the bishop, I'm going to tell the county. He said, you're an innovator. And finally, I pulled him aside. I said, Russ, Russ, I stole this from Willow Creek. They've been doing this for 25 years. <laughs> so it's a willingness to, to learn from the people who are being successful. Yeah. And part of it, too, is not everyone celebrates Christmas on Christmas Day. You're right. right. My family celebrates Christmas on Christmas Eve. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so Christmas, you know, like 24th service is not going to work for her. Yeah, yeah, everyone. Mm -hmm. That's so you have that's, that's part of part of, of being flexible and part of listening and part of yeah, you know, be willing to You got you got experiment. You got to listen. You got to be relational. And, and that's you got to remember change. that there's other people with other cultures that you, you know that you think it fits your culture that day, but other people can't fit into their culture. And that's probably why the twenty third was so popular too. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. People were shopping. People were like, this is great. Well, the last minute. I could have Christmas. All right, friends, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One more week. We'll look at the uh, processes.